Tonight I'm going to talk about reality and delusion. The world is often called, at least in certain religions, an illusion. Perhaps Eastern religions. I want to talk about that. Let's begin by admitting the obvious. The world is real. Real table, real desk, real people. Tap the desk and you hear it, feel it. It's here. Now, some philosophers have questioned the reality of the world. This is the brain in a vat idea. That maybe we're just brains in a vat and we're being stimulated with electrodes to feel and smell and taste and whatever, certain things. This was the basis of a popular movie. Another philosopher who questioned our perception of the reality of the world was Berkeley. And he came up with idealism. And his, his belief was that Everything exists in a mind or is dependent on a mind and therefore physical objects are bundles of ideas. I'll get back to that idea in a second, a variant of it. There was a famous incident where Samuel Johnson heard of Ber Berkeley's uh, idealism and decided to refute it by kicking a stone and there's uh, even a statue of him somewhere doing exactly that. I could say that matter is you could call it a theoretical construct. The idea is that I feel something, and all I feel is something pushing on my hand. I see something. All I see is light. That's all my eyes can see. I can knock the table. I can hear something. And I put those three things together, and they say a table must exist. And that's exactly what a theoretical construct is. Here they just call it a construct, and then in uh, Wikipedia it's called a hypothetical construct. Same thing. It's explains what we do experience. So I experience the sound and the sight and the feel of something and they're all consistent. So I say, oh, you must be a desk. And here they say, for instance, like intelligence or motivation. You can't see intelligence. You can just see its result. And then you, you assume that something called intelligence exists. Okay. But for our purposes, let's just forget all that. The world is real. Here it is. It's real. No problem. So the world is real. But is it real? The idea is there's different kinds of reality and there's a higher kind of reality that the world just doesn't quite qualify for. One problem with the world is that it's transitory, it's impermanent. The things change constantly. For instance, the number one is just static. It doesn't change. It's what it always was. But the world changes every second. And there's nothing that we know of, unless you want to talk about the ultimate ground of existence, which we believe is eternal. But in the uh, world, above that level, that ultimate level, there's nothing that, as far as we know is eternal, at least as far as I know. Uh, even the proton has a, a lifespan, or at least they, they suppose it does. I don't know if this has been verified. So, another property of the world is it's not perfectly satisfying. We might have a day that's perfectly satisfying, but then that day passes, and we have a lot of days which aren't so great. Uh, we, we get tired of things. Things lose their charm sometime. And so, uh, now, I, in another uh, clip, this one, I discussed the idea that when entities are seen from the viewpoint of oneness, they have no positive or negative, they're just there, they're just isness, is in the forefront. But as we descend to duality, things inevitably take on a plus and a minus. Sometimes we only see the plus, sometimes we only see the minus, but in with this, my idea was that they take on both. Since we've talked about impermanence, and we've talked about the unsatisfactoriness of the world. We might as well talk about no self, because uh, these were what Buddha called the three marks of existence. No self probably could use an episode of its own, but just briefly, the idea of no self or non-self is that uh, here we go. Buddha taught the non-existence of eternal souls. So he taught that, for instance, we were component objects, and when uh, the five aggregates disperse, we cease to exist, and uh, well, I did 
in these two clips talk about identity and I'll just refer you to them and but the idea is that if the ultimate ground of existence is the one is all that exists it is in a sense playing us like an actor playing Hamlet so you could say that the Hamlet that you see on the screen here has no real existence because an actor is playing him now the actor has real existence and in our theology that would be the the one the ultimate ground of existence but the characters that it's playing you and me I don't have ultimate existence I don't have a real self because even if consciousness is our self consciousness is, is the same probably for all of us so there's no distinguishing self that's uniquely me and so that's uh, was what uh, was Buddha taught uh, now I also mentioned that I believe Buddha had an idea of uh, an ultimate ground of existence based on this this quote so I think he was saying basically what I was just saying a minute ago was at least that's my interpretation was that there's nothing there's I have a body emotions and intellect they're all transitory and will eventually go and my if, if consciousness is my soul that is like a drop of water it doesn't it's not uniquely mine it doesn't distinguish me from anyone else by the way I got a lot of these ideas this is a book I bought it might have been in college it's a long 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 time ago interesting book I don't know if it's still available in this clip I talked about heaven and hell and I decided uh, I, I um, stipulated that heaven and hell aren't eternal and that if heaven was eternal we probably wouldn't like it existing as my separate self for eternity even if I could learn anything I wanted to or do anything I wanted to might get old after a while eternity is a very long time okay anyway here are three characteristics of the world we live in that I just spoke about although self and non-self could probably use their own clip now I want to get on to the relationship between the world and the uncreated light and how how in some sense the world is an illusion here is uh, Ramana Maharshi and I want to recast these three uh, statements in, in a, phrases in, in a slightly different way the ultimate ground of existence is real the world is unreal the ultimate ground of existence is the world now that kind of breaks logic if A is B and A has a certain property if A is B then B should have that property but I would like to this is the essence of, of this talk and I want to explain how I view these statements and, and uh, uh, kind of um, make them harmonious and so the idea is this in our theology the uncreated light the eternal the ultimate ground of existence is like the light that projects onto a movie screen and the images on that movie screen are like us like me you the cars the house the trees the world and so we have the world or the universe being projected by the ultimate ground of existence and so if we were to maybe these make more sense in that the uncreated light is real but the world is an image and I might change this statement I will change this statement to be this the continual action of the uncreated light creates and sustains this world it's as if the universe were like a fountain and it's the action of the uncreated light just like in a fountain it's the it's the action of the water that creates the fountain and so in this sense the fountain is real we can see it and the water is real but in a sense the water is more real than the fountain it's like the thing I've said before about the fist and the hand uh, there it is uh, the fist is an action of the hand so I can open my fist and the fist still uh, the hand still exists but the fist just disappears and that's the idea that the action has a lesser reality than what is acting the fountain has a lesser reality than the water so in that sense we could see the world as an image of the uncreated light we could also see it relative to the uncreated light as being unreal or at least somewhat illusory I believe in India they have the image of the dance of Shiva the idea being that the dance the action is what creates the world and but this is what's creating the world and in, in, in my view and so we have the transitory and impermanent that's the world we know versus the eternal which is the uh, eternal light the ultimate ground of existence we have the unsatisfying 
versus the satisfying. I'll talk about that in a minute. And the non-self versus we'll call the uncreated light the self of the universe. As again, as again I say, non-self and self could really deserve their own episode. But I did want to mention in this clip, I talked about an experience that I had of the uncreated light, or at least I believe it was. And I didn't mention that when I had that experience, I remember feeling paradoxically that I had never felt so good about living, but that if someone were to tell me I would die in the next minute, I wouldn't have cared. It would have been just fine. I felt that good that it would have mattered. So I would call it maybe, it was pretty satisfying feeling. What was unsatisfying about it was the intensity, how it became a little hard to bear after a while. But maybe if I had stayed there and gotten habituated to it, maybe I would have been perfectly satisfied. At least that's what some religions say, that that's nirvana, that's uh, being enlightened, that's whatever. So uh, there we ha have it again. Uh, I just talked about the satisfaction. And as always, I'm just a guy sharing my opinions uh, what I said uh, isn't necessarily what a Buddhist teacher would say or whatever. And actually, I've said that a couple times. I was going to skip it, but I found this image and I, I just couldn't uh, resist. Okay, so thank you.